Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Uh, I'm going to make things really awkward for a second and ask if you could all just stand up, please. <laughs> I don't want you getting tired and falling asleep in these wonderfully comfy chairs. So we're going to do some exercises, uh, which is, I know, the reason that you come to programming conferences. So we're not going to do anything particularly strenuous, and if you are worried that you're going to hurt yourself, please don't do this. But the thing that we're going to do is air squats. So if you've never seen this before, let me demonstrate for you. Uh, you put your arms anywhere you like, you go down, and you go up. Think you can do that? <laughs> okay, I'll count us down, and then we'll do 10 of these things, okay? So three, two, one. One, two. You're all very friendly <laughs> to be doing this. Four, five, six, halfway mark. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you very much. Please sit down. Okay, let's get started. This talk's called Transforming PHP. Um, I'm Chris, uh, in case you've forgotten <laughs> since just now. Um, and the main purpose of this talk, the main thing I want you to take away, apart from, how, uh, apart from how athletically strenuous it was, is that I want to show you how you can add your own syntax into PHP. I've called it Transforming PHP because for me it's been quite a transformative thing to realize. And to kind of explain this, let me ask you a question. By show of hands, how many of you started in a different programming language? A lot of you. Um, for some of us, it's .NET languages. For some of us, it's JavaScript or Ruby. Uh, and each language has its own little bits of syntax, right? Things that are nice for the language, things that work well in the language. By show of hands, while using another language, how many have you, of you have thought of the question, gee, I wish I could use this little bit of syntax from this other language in PHP. Wouldn't it be nice? A lot of you. This is a really big concern for people that no one ever talks about, because for us, we're just used to using whatever syntax PHP gives us to use. And we can do the nice syntax things in the other languages that we like, but we've got to do it there. We can't really use it for our day-to-day -day projects. And the reason this topic has been so transformative to me is because I can't remember a time when I asked that question and I couldn't answer it with, well, let me just add the syntax to PHP. I no longer think in the confines of just the syntax that PHP gives me because I've discovered there are other options, and I want to show you what those options are. But if you're in this boat right now, I'm glad that you've come here and you're going to learn a lot of things, I hope. For you have a few options, a few different things you can do to get your own syntax working in PHP. The first that I'm obligated to tell you about because it's good for community, but maybe not uh, as much fun for you, is to submit the syntax that you want to the core interpreter, or HHVM if you prefer to use that. And there are some laborious steps involved with this. Let's look at them. The first is that you need to write an RFC or a request for comments. It's a, a very standard format in which you need to describe the current status quo, a problem you're trying to solve, a solution for that, and potentially some code that you want to show solves that. And so all main programming language syntax changes that enter PHP interpreter go through this process. You should also try and get a patch. You don't have to write it yourself because maybe you're not a C developer and uh, you can rope in someone else to do the patch for you, as long as it adheres to the RFC that you've made. This isn't a requirement for adding your new syntax to core, but your RFC is going to be taken a little bit more seriously if you can demonstrate the viability of the syntax that you want to add. And finally, you need to hope that the change you want to make is popular enough, because all syntax changes, especially breaking syntax changes, need a lot of votes from traditionally conservative developers in order to enter into the language. So you need to jump through these hoops. Maybe you're willing to do this, and you've done all these things, and maybe you're lucky enough that your change is uh, popular enough that you can expect it in the next minor version, or if it's breaking changes, the next major version. So even though you've done all the work now, you can't use it until then, some months or some years. Fortunately, PHP uh, itself has been iterating quite quickly recently, so that's perhaps less of a problem. 
Another option is you can make your own compiler. Hands up if you've ever tried to do this. <laughs> yeah, not many people, because it's a lot of work, come to find. There are some steps involved in this. Uh, you need to start off with an idea of the syntax you want to add, or in terms of making a new compiler, trying to figure out what the whole language is supposed to do. Recently, or I guess not as recently, PHP has gotten some kind of specification from some hardworking folks uh, over at Facebook, but if you want to make an entirely new language, you need to decide what or how that language works, what the syntax is for it. Then you need to be able to take a string of source code in your new syntax and split it up into the important parts that matter to the language, the keywords and the characters that define its syntax. Those important parts are sometimes called tokens, and so splitting up the string is often called tokenizing. And what you get from that is a list of meaningful things in your language. Then you need to be able to arrange those meaningful things via some parsing into a hierarchy of behavior. To give you an example of this, if you consider an if statement, for example, there is an if keyword, and then there are some parentheses, and inside that there is an expression, and then there are some curly braces, and inside that there's any number of expressions. And so, though you may start off with a list of tokens, where you have if, opening bracket, some expression, tokens, closing bracket, you need to arrange that into a meaningful hierarchy, where the conditional expression is a child of the whole thing, and the body of the if statement is a child of the if statement. This is sometimes the result of this is sometimes called an abstract syntax tree. And when you have an abstract syntax tree or a hierarchy, then you need to decide whether you want to immediately execute it or translate it into another language. So, though this is perhaps an oversimplification of things, PHP we can think of as an immediately executed kind of language. We write PHP, and that just goes through the interpreter down to machine code. Versus something like CoffeeScript or TypeScript, where we write in one language, we can write in one language, and then it will compile that to another language, like JavaScript. Execute immediately or translate. Now, this is a very fun process, but it may leave you wondering whether you have the skills to do this. I mean, maybe three or four people put their hands up for having tried to create a compiler, and it is a lot of work, and perhaps some of the reason why you haven't tried it is because maybe you think that it takes a certain kind of expert or a certain tool set or a certain amount of study to be able to do this. And while, yes, there is a lot of really clever code that goes into modern compilers, you don't have to start there. You don't have to start with your first painting being the Mona Lisa. You can start small. And if your language or your syntax gets popular enough, someone with the chops is going to come along and build a better compiler or help you optimize your compiler. So the steps involved here, we can describe as taking a string of source code that has some new syntax in. I write a lot of React.js code in my day job, and so I was wondering if it would be possible to add JSX-like syntax or inline HTML into PHP and to get this to execute. We have some ordinary PHP code, and then we have HTML opening tags and closing tags, and potentially nested children. In order to get a compiler to work with this, we need to first split it up into a list of meaningful, important bits or tokens. They might take the form of something like this, where we have, to begin with, just some literal text, because we don't want to rewrite the whole PHP language. The stuff that's just ordinary PHP, we can literally write from one syntax into another. But then we get to the important bits, like opening tags and nested expressions and closing tags. Sometimes tokenization is at a more granular level, where it will identify individual brackets or symbols. And sometimes, like in this case, we can do it at quite a high level, because it's a simple structure. HTML opening tags and closing tags are simple structures. Anyway, once we've got this list of tokens, and then some literal text underneath it again, we can start to arrange this in a hierarchy of behavior. We can do something like, well, we can keep our literal tag, because we didn't need to transform that. But now the opening tag and its nested children and the closing tag can become 
a structure like this, where we take the attributes of the opening tag and nest them, and we take all the children and recursively tokenize and arrange those until we have like a tree structure. And then right at the end, we have our literal text again. Now, I'm going through this very quickly, and it's important to know that when you're making a compiler for the first time, you're going to make mistakes, and there's a bunch of trial and error to go through. But if you stick with it long enough and you experiment with it long enough and you use these string manipulation methods, then what you're going to get in the end is a compiler that introduces your syntax. And so if your goal was to make React-like syntax and compile it to syntactically valid PHP, you can get there. And in the end, you can get the output that you want. If this particular example interests you, or you want to spend some time digging into making your first compiler and, and the work involved in that, here are some useful links for you. And I'll show you a link to the slides at the end. But uh, the first one is some source code that implements this simple compiler to do HTML in line with PHP. Uh, the second link is a hilarious example application that uses this to make a to-do list application using no JavaScript where the forms and the logic are all done using these components. And it's, it's uh, esoteric, to put it mildly. And finally, that link at the end is a full tutorial about writing your own compiler, from tokenizing to passing into an AST to writing into another syntax. So if that kind of thing interests you, those links should be uh, useful to you. But this isn't the only option. Remember, the first option was submitting to core, making your own compiler is a second option. But again, there's a lot of work involved there. You have to do the full specification, unless you piggyback on PHP syntax like this has. You have to um, tokenize and pass, and then finally decide whether you execute or write to another language and how that actually works. You could cut out a few of the steps by using a compiler generator, something where you use a custom DSL, and it makes the tokenizer and the parser for you. And so it cuts out those two steps, but really there's still a lot of work involved because specification and execution or translation are really the biggest parts of this. There is another option, and is the option that I'm going to spend the most time showing you because I think it has the most potential to realize the syntax that you want today. And that's using language macros. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, PHP doesn't support language macros, You'd be right, until recently, because recently uh, a very clever friend of mine put together a library that would enable this for us. Uh, that friend's name is Marsha, and he made a library called YAY. I have no idea what YAY stands for, um, but if you want to check it out, the source code's up there. I'm just going to have a drink of water. So YAY's interesting because it does the tokenization and the passing for you. You can think of it kind of like preg replace, but for tokens and source code. With yay, you define macros in terms of a block of code to match, a list of tokens to match, and then some other syntax to replace it with. So in this first block, I'm saying find all the bare strings of match and in the second block, I'm saying, with those found strings, replace them with the string, the base string, replace. What I'm expecting is that to happen. And so when we execute this through yay, that actually does happen. We get the output we want. I'm going to show you some more examples of yay macros. But an important thing to note is that at the moment, this documentation's very sparse. So there's even more trial and error involved in this. Once you learn the macro syntax, things get easier to do. And if you have someone to help you when you get stuck, um, if some, you have someone to speak to on Twitter, for example, then uh, it goes a little bit easier. But let's look at some other macros after. Uh, OK, so I said, yay, tokenizes a string. Um, it matches a series of tokens, and it replaces that with code that you want. <clears throat> 
We'll look at the examples after I cover some pros and cons. It's good because you don't have to submit your new syntax to call. So you don't have to write an RFC or submit a patch in C or hope it gets voted in and then wait for a few months to use it. Uh, you can just make your macro and have it work. It's good because you don't have to rebuild the whole compiler. Uh, there's a lot less effort involved just in pattern matching. And it's a library. You don't need to install an extension to use this. You can require this composer dependency and start writing your own macros right now, if you want. Just don't do it right now, please. <laughs> OK, so some examples of macros. Say I wanted to support this kind of Ruby-esque initialization. Maybe I wanted to be able to chain things on here. And in PHP, we can't typically say something like new standard class and a function call, because we first have to wrap these in brackets. But Ruby has this sort of syntax, and I kind of fancy it. So to do this, we can define a macro uh, that we want to execute recursively. In other words, something that will allow us to do that, for example. Uh, we match a fully qualified namespace identity, giving it the alias name. We match the arrow operator and the new keyword, which matches this down here. And then we match parentheses with any optional value inside them. Because what we want is if we say something like foo, we want it to translate to uh, something like new standard class foo. So we match any optional value inside a set of parentheses and give this an alias. This is what we're matching, and we want it to translate it into this. Because we've got the tokens as part of this named thing, we just say that whole named thing. And if there's anything inside the brackets, it'll put that there. If it's just brackets, it'll put that there. And when we execute this code, oh, oh I just closed my slide deck. Hold on a second. OK, and when we execute this code, then we'll see it translates into syntax that will run in modern PHP environments. But we can define the code using custom syntax. OK, perhaps that's not too useful an example. Let's look at another one. Hands up if you've used Python, anyone, or seen Python? <laughs> okay. Maybe you like the Python uh, string interpolation syntax, or sprint f, in Python land. And it uses syntax resembling this. So if you had a lot of log statements, for example, where you were doing the traditional PHP sprint f, and you wanted to replace that with a new kind of syntax, you could define a macro like this. You use the token name constant from PHP documentation. There's a whole list of different tokens that you can match. And then you match the percent symbol, some square brackets, and some values inside that. It doesn't really make sense for those values to be optional, because then what are you, what are you uh, interpolating? So we don't, we don't um, allow those values to be optional. But Using this list of tokens, we can replace it with a call to sprint f. And perhaps this could be a little bit more elegant in code. But it does the trick. If we execute this, we'll see we get the syntax we want in the end. It's functional, and it outputs the results that we seek. OK, one more example macro. And this one's perhaps quite a lot more practical. OK, recently there was an RFC to add a pipe operator. The status quo is that in PHP and in JavaScript, uh, if you're familiar with that language as well, when you want to run a chain of functions, you have to do it from the inside out. Say you wanted to take the string and make it all caps. Well, this is the innermost function call. And if you wanted to make the result of that function call reversed, well, that's one level up. And finally, if you wanted to wrap it in some symbols, that's another level up. 
And if you have this long chain of function calls, you start to do from the inside, and then one level out, and then one level out. And it's harder to read at a glance what that code's doing. So I forget who, but someone introduced the idea of this kind of syntax as an RFC, where you can call your first function, and you can take the results of that function call with a special placeholder into another expression. So first, we make it all caps, and then we reverse it, and then we wrap it. And the result of this entire expression gets assigned to a variable. However, PHP doesn't support this, and I don't think that pipe RFC got accepted, which is a downside for your syntax not being popular enough. And so what we can do is make our own macro for this. For a start, we can replace that special placeholder with some kind of constant value that we can detect in PHP syntax later on. And this can, be, this can be really anything. You'll see why. But the idea is that we want to translate new syntax into syntactically valid PHP. And sometimes, in order to do that, we need to write some syntax transformation and then some function that accepts a kind of data structure that will do the behavior that we want it to do. So we replace the special placeholder with some kind of magic constant which, again, can be anything. This is just a simplified example. <sighs> and then we do a really verbose macro. <laughs> uh, we match the first expression. This just looks like a function call. It takes this code here, or more accurately, it takes this code here. Then we match every sub subsequent function call that begins with a pipe operator. And we take the first individual match and then a list of subsequent matches and combine them into an array-like structure. This looks really complex, and you may have to stare at this for a little while, as I did, to be able to understand what this is doing at the end of the day. But this is an alias for arguments that were optionally matched in subsequent calls, and this is an alias for arguments that were matched in the first call. Alias, alias, some special keywords to convert things like variables into strings, uh, some special syntax to loop through a list of matches. What we get at the end of this, even though this is a bit of a confusing mess, what we get at the end of this is an array-like structure. I want to show you what that looks like first, and then I'll show you the function that does the rest of the work. So given some source code, which resembles this over here, given the source code that resembles this, it creates an array-like structure, which you'll notice is three subarrays, where the first match is the one at the top, and then we want the results of that first match to wind up in the place of that special constant. And we want the results of the second match to wind up in the place of the third constant. Structurally, this is along the lines of what we want, but we also need a special function to translate that array-like structure into the chained calls that we expect. So given an array of calls to make, if the value is the special constant, then because we're referencing it by, by reference here, because we've got it by reference here, we take the result of the previous call and assign it to that reference, basically swapping out the string underscore underscore pipe with the value of the previous call. If I execute this again, you'll see that array structure. And if I look at the output, it looks like what we want. Just so that you know I'm not actually uh, pulling a fast one here, do you, can someone suggest the name of a method to me, like that, uh, an animal name. Can someone shout out an animal name? Monkey. Monkey, OK. I'm going to replace reverse with monkey. Thanks for that. And can someone shout out the name of a uh, fruit? Apple. Apple. Grapefruit. I like grapefruit better. <laughs> uh, or if you're a Monty, uh, Monty Python, uh, Faulty Towers fan, Grail Frut. There we go. Okay, 
And so our array-like structure still looks like we expect. And the output, I don't have a defined reverse function. Where's that? <laughs> Let me just comment that out. There we go. OK, so it's real. Not kidding around. But using a series of macros in how many lines of code? Let's have a look here. It ends on 56. It starts on 26. So using 30 lines of code, we've made a macro that we can use in existing PHP code to support an RFC that got voted out. And we didn't have to make an extension or recompile PHP or submit this to anyone for review. We could have identified somewhere in our application that worked really well with pipe syntax and made the macro just for that and cut down on a lot of boilerplate code or a lot of difficult to debug or reason about code. And we did it with very little effort. The problem with yay is one of integration. It's made as a tool that does the tokenization and the passing for us, and it does that very well. But in order to use it, we have to pass a PHP file with the macros defined at the top of it through a binary and channel the output into a file and then load that file instead, which is OK to try and create macros. But in a real application, that's a bit of a pain. So I made a thing called pre which you can fiddle around with at preprocess.io. Uh, as a side note, that's um, one of the sites that I've had the most fun working on, because it combines a lot of really interesting technologies. And I'd love to talk about it if you try that after the talk, and it interests you. But pre provides some tools. In the instance where you have a file that you want to be preprocessed with macros, and you would typically use the PHP require keyword in order to bring that into the scope of the current script. There is this file which will look at the path of a macro file, process it, and then include the processed file, similarly to if you just used the require keyword. So this is good if you have maybe a helper's function file uh, in your, defined in your composer's autoload files section. But for the most part, I found that if I have classes with PSR for autoloading, uh, I made pre to be able to allow you to opt into preprocessing just by renaming the extension of PSR for autoloaded classes from .php to .pre. So it's an opt-in system, similar to uh, if you use hack, for example, that's also opt-in in a similar way. And on top of this plugin, I've built some macros from syntax from other languages that I like. And maybe you'll like them as well, but they're suggestions. The first one, which I've actually found most useful, is short array closures. So in PHP, you can define a function, you can assign it to a variable. But if you want to use something inside that function from outside, say, for instance, you want to define a terminator, uh, you can't, not directly anyway. If I execute this, the output is not going to have that terminator in there. And that's because in PHP, we have this concept of explicit closures, where if I use that variable, now it will have the output I expect. In such a tiny function, this doesn't actually make that much difference, because it's really easy to see where that context comes from. But in a very complex function, maybe that context comes from very far away. Maybe we forget about it, and it's a subtle problem until we discover three weeks later this bug we've been trying to solve is just because we haven't used the variable that we thought we had. So with the short closures macro, we can do this. I'll show you what the output looks like in a little bit, but it compiles to an output that we expect and we don't have to use this explicitly. It compiles to something like this, which at first glance you might not like the style of. 
but I think it's cool. So. <laughs> in the end, it's doing essentially the same thing. It's looking for the variables that we use inside the function that aren't part of the parameters and aren't defined, and it's using them from outside. If they exist, then it'll use that value directly as it does here. But if they don't, it'll default this variable's value to null, so that when we, assign it, when we use it by reference, we don't get an error. And the only string value in this array is the function that we define, which we dereference immediately, so that we can turn an expression into another expression that also does things like define variables as a separate sub-expression. All of this code, by the way, is formatted with the PHP CS fixer uh, automatically. So with the exception of that React.js syntax you saw earlier, you're going to get code that looks relatively clean, um, even though it's doing some magical stuff in the background. So short closures are fun. What about async await? Uh, hands up if you've been to a conference talk or experimented with collections of libraries like React PHP or AMP PHP. Yes, very few people. <laughs> You're missing out because <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Asynchronous frameworks like this really deserve entire talks and books on their own, but the gist of it is that you can start to write PHP code that looks like synchronous blocking PHP code, but acts like asynchronous promise or event-driven code like what you may be familiar with Node.js-based server-side applications, or JavaScript in general. And the way that works is by using the yield keyword to do some magical generator-driven coroutine stuff. These libraries allow people to write code that looks blocking. So this code in here looks fairly straightforward. But this function actually returns a PHP implementation of a promise. And amp deals with that and resolves its value in a very clever way. However, if you use AMP to do this code, you're going to find that you have to write this boilerplate a lot, because it can't always de deal directly with generators. Sometimes it has to have promises or coroutines. And this might actually turn you off writing a lot of asynchronous code to begin with, or entire asynchronous applications. So I had this problem. And even though this kind of code will execute via AMP, or actually I need to rename this function call because I'm using an older version, um, even though this code will work, um, it's working via asynchronous code. By the way, did you know this highlight string exists in PHP core? Syntax highlighting is HTML in PHP core. It's hilarious. OK, so <laughs> it outputs syntax highlighted HTML code. But again, this boilerplate's a bit troublesome. With the async await macro, we can get rid of quite a lot of it. Because I like await here, we can replace that. And in order to do the other code, we can do async. So we went from a five-line function to a three-line function. But um, more importantly, that boilerplate, we don't really need to care about. We can just write functions that await the result of promises and declare themselves as asynchronous. And if we execute this, I'll show you the output in a bit, but the, the result is the same. It's exactly what we expect. It adds this boilerplate in for us, referencing the parameters and type hinting against a promise so that your IDE doesn't freak out too much. And essentially, it just works in the end. We've got some fancy new syntax, which evaluates to syntactically valid PHP and outputs the same result we had before. So your tests will pass. Class accesses. Hands up if you've used Symfony or Doctrine. Hmm. The best practices, but that hmm is respect, um, because they're cool frameworks and libraries. But um, best practices these days for exposing private properties as public tend to be not to use underscore underscore get. Yeah? I don't see any shaked heads, so people tend to agree. <laughs> not using something like this. I mean, we could use something like this, and we could return 
this currency, and maybe we define it as that. And so if we create a new instance of money, oh, without a typo there, and we print its currency, uh, th no, not this, money currency, then what we expect to see is euro. But this isn't best practice, let's say. OK, our output's what we expect. More likely these days, if you speak to someone in the know, they're going to tell you, rather create a named accessor for this, something like get currency. And then it doesn't need to accept a parameter, and it should work in the same way. Oh, actually, it's not going to work in the same way, because we're using property access. We'll have to do something like get currency. And we get the same result. I'm going to ask lots of hands questions. Hands up if you've used C Sharp. OK. One of the favorite things, I, I use C Sharp before I use PHP, and one of the favorite things from C Sharp that I like is its getter setter syntax. It's very clear where properties relate to their getters and setters. It's concise. It's lovely. And we can use it in this case as well. We can say something like private currency and define a getter for it. And so now our code at the bottom is going to continue to work. Oh, no, it doesn't, because I haven't defined a default for this. Maybe something like that. Would that work? Yes, OK. So I had to define a default for that. We can also do something like define setters in line as well. This currency is value. And so here, first, we can set the currency. Uh, set currency. Does this work? Yes, it does. OK. So that's a bit more concise than saying, than defining a get currency method and a set currency method. Uh, it also lets us do things like shorthand, where we can say unset. And the resulting code creates a function for us. There's a trait that's loaded in here as well, called class accessors trait, where we can use these as properties. And make no mistake, this is using underscore underscore get. But it's code we don't have to write or maintain. All of these have shorthand, although with a shorthand of get, we can't define the default value in that way that we expect. So we're going to get null value here. But even with the shorthand, you'll see it generates functions that our IDE will like. And as an added bonus, we can do things like define immutability or pseudo immutability, where we can define this as immutable, and then the function that's generated is with currency. It creates a clone, sets that value, and returns the clone. Any idea how we would do that with a custom defined getter function body? We did something like this. Uh, swords, you see words, value. Any idea how we do something like that? That's very tricky. The generated code for this creates a function that assigns the value and then binds that to the instance of the clone and then executes that and then returns the clone. Which is, which is interesting code, right? But it's code we don't have to write or maintain. We just write this using syntax that suits our application or our mindset, syntax we like from other languages, DSLs that work well for our team. And it takes care of the code that gets generated from this. I've got to hurry through these examples now. Um, there's another little bit of cute syntax, which is where we can take curly braces around arrays and automatically those get wrapped as collections. So I've got a really slim implementation of a collection class, which will allow us to do things like chain method calls, 
something like this, filter. And we can even use short array syntax here. And when we execute that, it gets rewritten into the short array closure down here and the collection instance over here. And the result is uh, that I've broken something. Array filter, array map, that's right. I need to chain these because now the result of this is a collection instance. I could actually say something like to array, I guess. This should work again. There we go. OK. So you can even define things as small as custom data structures using a special kind of bracketing syntax that automatically box variables for you. You could replace this with a call to the collect function, for example, and get the same result. Something like yay and pre are really good for testing future syntax. Before you get to writing an RFC and a patch and getting that voted in, you can think of some syntax you like from another language or some new syntax that's useful to you, and you can test it right now. It's also good for refactoring your app, which I'll show you in a couple of examples. Um, I was typing this a lot in an app, making strings that relate to a file system path. And so one of the optimizations that I decided to make was to replace this syntax just with a double dot. Something like that. And running that translates to the same thing. I still get the same pathing syntax, but here, this feels a lot cleaner to me. It works a lot better for this application that I've got. Additionally, I was finding myself typing this kind of stuff a lot. So instead, I made a macro where I could just type that, which does something similar to the required behavior. And it still translates to the same thing in the end, but it makes things a lot cleaner for my application, as long as it's well documented for me. Another example is combining different kinds of macros here. So we've got a lot of code inside an asynchronous function, which we can take out a level, because we don't need to write that boilerplate code anymore, as long as we declare this public uh, as long as we declare this as an async public function. And so first off, it's going to do that boilerplate for us, where it puts this stuff in for us and a type hit hints as a promise. Also, because that function doesn't have a yield, it's going to add that after return just to turn this into a generator when it gets executed, which is a helpful little thing that can do for us. We can do things like define errors as a collection instead of an array. We can override the value of parameters to be a collection. And then we can start using things like object access here, which is a really small syntax change, but starts to give us a lot of value because it cuts down the code that we have to look at. And so things like conditional checks, for example, become a lot cleaner just in this little bit of refactoring that I've done for this app. OK. There was another refactoring example I'm not even going to look at. But um, essentially, it is just using short array closures in deeply nested structures, which will still produce the same code in the end, but is a lot cleaner for us. And we don't have to remember to use those variables in a very complex function call. Things like yay and pre are bad because there's poor tooling. At the moment, as far as I'm aware, there is no Atom or Sublime or PHP Storm extension that will recognize these new syntax features. And mostly that's because it's new syntax that I've added. It's not gone through any review process, which is why that review process is good at a language level. But you need to know that if you use stuff like this, at least in the beginning, there's going to be poor editor support for your new syntax. If you can deal with that, that's cool. There's sparse documentation. There's sparse documentation for pre. There's no documentation for yay. So there's a lot of trial and error and experimentation you need to do there. And that's no fault of, uh, that's no fault of Marsha. It's just there's such a lot of work to be done that documentation is not as much a priority in the meantime. And these two things, these first two things, 
are mostly because there's no specification for this new syntax. If we had something like in JavaScript land, where there is a body of people voting on new syntax and iterating rapidly, or at least more than one person making up the syntax, there would be some kind of informal specification. And so tooling could be better, and documentation could be better. But these things are getting better all the time. There's some documentation at preprocess.io, and there are a growing list of people on Twitter who can answer questions about the token syntax and the pre-macros. Anyway, that's all I've got time for. Um, there, is, there are some minutes for questions, and there's a bonus round of code after that if there are no questions. So what are the questions? Um, can you give an example of um, like error handling or something? I feel like the translation layer might obscure the error reporting. The outputted code is as I said, is formatted with CSFixer in PSR2 code. Um, the way that pre works for PSR4 classes, if I can show you, is that it takes um, the pre files that you have here and compiles them to PHP files right next to that, with a warning not to modify those files because it changes the last. But if you look at the resulting code, oh, you can't see it. Where'd my screen go? Give me my screen back. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. Um, if you look at the resulting code, it's, it's kind of clean to tell. And the exception messages that you get will be relating to the compiled code. So debugging tactics and that are pretty much all I can recommend for now. The next step in something like this would be to have source maps, for example. But that's far off in, in where Yay is at the moment. It's far off from that. Okay. But it's a very good question. How do you debug this stuff? Thank you. All right. More Anyone questions? Else? Um, what is the target group for this? Is this like for PHP core contributors, or can you see this in like a commercial uh, setting, basically? The target group for this, that's another very good question. The target group for this is people who want to experiment and don't want to make their own compilers. Okay. It is even easier to use this stuff, pre-specifically, than it is to set something similar like Babel up in JavaScript. Because just Composer is so great and Yay is so great that it's been easy to set this up. It's for people who haven't made their own compilers or perhaps are fearing making their own compilers or don't know how to get their own syntax in PHP and feel restricted by that. So if you're happy with PHP syntax and you never want to add anything, it's probably a waste of your time. Yeah, but I mean, um, I'm just afraid that if you're going to use it like that, just not in an experimental way or testing for um, contributing, that you're going to isolate yourself as a developer, basically. So there are a few tools that can mitigate that kind of problem. If you have good testing on your code, using macros is perhaps less volatile. If you use Compose's lock file, different versions of macros are less of a problem. There is a lot of work that can be done, like source maps I mentioned, or like um, more isolation about which source files get different macros that can be done. And those are definitely improvements that can be made. But I think if you document it and you test it, it's no more volatile than any other PHP code you write. Please give a warm applause for Chris, everyone. <laughs>